in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm told that once Alexei Navalny was asked who he thought was the greatest politician. He replied, Jesus Christ. When Navalny a few years ago decided to go back to Russia to sure imprisonment and a dangerously uncertain future, the words of Jesus Christ hung in the air. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world if they forfeit their life? The news the week before last of Navalny's death in the prison camp in, within the Arctic Circle, we learned of another martyr, another follower of Jesus Christ. Today's words in the Gospel are as challenging to us today as they have ever been. What does it mean for you and for me today to deny self, take up our cross and follow him? A couple of weeks ago, I was preaching in the, in the American Episcopal Church in Frankfurt, and I told them this story, and I want to tell it to you today too. Kent Nerban was running a seminar on fatherhood for a group of teachers. On the last evening, a Nigerian man was scheduled to come in and drum with the group. Nurban wasn't quite sure who had invited him, and he personally didn't look on this as being a particularly significant part of the weekend. But he goes on, On the night of his presentation, the man arrived, about an hour early, with an extensive collection of drums, of all colours, shapes and sizes. He conscientiously tuned them and set them out for our use. One by one, we shuffled in for his session, and took our seats in the circle that he had arranged. He had a smile of incredible warmth and dignity of manner that made us all feel clumsy and raw-boned. But his gracious heart quickly took away all our self-consciousness and soon we were drumming together and working our way towards a common rhythm and experience. It was a wonderful time, Nurban writes, far more meaningful than any of the participants had expected. The man and his drums brought us a joy and a camaraderie that had not existed up to that point. The music became a metaphor for community, and to a person we were touched by what he had created. As it got near to nine o'clock, the time scheduled for the end of the event, a number of people asked the man to stay a bit longer. He smiled graciously but said, I'm sorry, I have to leave. Because we felt close to him through our time together, we pressed him just a little bit longer, we asked. I can't, he, he explained. I have to catch a plane. <coughs> I'm going back to Lagos for my mother's funeral. We were shocked. He'd been totally giving to us, totally present, treating us like our activity was the most important event in the world to him. And through it all, his heart had been carrying the burden of his mother's death. Your mother's funeral? We asked incredulously. Yes, he said. It was scheduled for last week, and we don't dare put it off again. Why was it put off? Someone asked. Oh, I said that I would come here and be with you, he replied matter-of-factly, so I had it changed. 
You put off your mother's funeral to be with us? The man smiled his deep, warm, loving smile. Our funerals aren't like yours, he said. There are many people who have to come. How many? someone asked. About 5,000, he said, all her village. And we, the 30 of us, looked at him. So you put that off for us? And he smiled again. Yes, I had told you that I would be here. And I'm honoured that you have shared the evening with me. And I thank you. And with that he got up and left. Nurban writes, we all sat in stunned silence. Overwhelmed by the sense of dignity and grace that this man had brought us. One by one we rose and made our way back to our rooms, lost in our own thoughts and feelings. Next day there were other activities, but our hearts were filled with the indelible image of a gentle man who had changed the time of his mother's funeral halfway around the world in order to spend a few hours of time with a group of 30 people he did not know because he had given his word. My brothers and sisters, all our actions on this earth have eternal life. And it's up to us to determine whether our actions have a life that increases the light in the world or add to the darkness. We need to understand, too, that the actions that increase the light in this world are actions usually that come from a death of self-interest. If any want to become my followers, said Jesus, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So I told that story about the man with the drums when I was in Frankfurt two weeks ago. And afterwards, someone came up to me and he told me of his village, the village where he grew up in South India. It was a Dalit village. Dalit is the lowest class in Hinduism. And he told how in the 19th century, an English woman, Rachel Smith, came from the London Mission Society and gave 40 years of her life to bring education to the women of that Dalit village. This man told me how she had taught his great-great-grandmother to read and write, and how he carries the memory of Rachel Smith's work in his heart. Without her, he said, who knows when education would have reached that village. He's finishing his PhD at the moment. When Rachel Smith left the village, he told me, she was over 80. And the whole village turned out. Some even lay on the railway tracks so that she couldn't leave them. My brothers and sisters, all our actions in this world have eternal life. But we have to determine, are our actions increasing the light in the world or are they adding to the darkness? And we need to understand that the actions that increase the light are usually actions that come from death of self-interest. If any want to become my followers, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Martin Luther King, in his last speech, the night before he was assassinated, called upon his disciples, sorry, his followers, his supporters, to develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. Dangerous unselfishness. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the good news will save it. Death of self-interest, da dangerous unselfishness. My brothers and sisters, how hard it is in our me, me, me generation. How hard it is to be different. How hard it is not to keep putting ourselves and our own personal wishes and agendas 
and needs first. Not to spend every waking hour of the day focused on me, my career, my future, my money, my family, my friends, my needs, my wishes, my holidays. Mother Teresa of Calcutta once said, the spiritual poverty of the Western world is so much greater than the physical poverty of our people. You in the West have millions of people who suffer such terrible loneliness and emptiness. People who feel unloved and unwanted. These people are not hungry in the physical sense, but they are in another way. They know they need something more than money, yet they don't know what it is. What they're missing really is a living relationship with God. <clears throat> Dear friends, all our deeds, all our words have eternal life. So let's ask ourselves today, how can my words, my actions, increase the light in the world rather than add to the darkness? How can I develop a dangerous unselfishness? Let's pray. Lord, Make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love with all our soul. For it is in giving that we receive it's in pardoning that we're pardoned. And it's in dying that we're born into eternal life. We keep some silence together.